This is Brayden Kelly here with Roger Martin, Dean of the, the Rotman School at the University of Toronto. We're here today talking about his book, The, the Design of Business, uh, here in Seattle, Washington. And I've just got a, a few questions for Roger today. Perfect. I'll just it's good to be here, by the way. I love Seattle. <laughs> well, you're, you caught a, a nice day. It's not raining on you. Um, so I'll just jump in and, and start with the, the questions. Yep. Uh, first, first question, you've been quoted as saying, innovation is killed with the two deadliest words in business. Prove it. Uh, so, how do you prove something that hasn't happened yet? Well, that's the problem. You can't. You cannot prove uh, something in advance by any of the accepted means of doing that. Uh, and so, the best thing you can do is is try something uh, and try something in a way that won't kill your organization. It's not so big; it'll kill your organization. And then generate proof. What I often say is the the bad news about the next three months are it's in the future and it doesn't count for proving anything. The good news is that in three months it'll be in the past and it can be used to, to uh, prove something. So that's why, that's why the whole idea from the design industry of rapid prototyping is so important. Rapid prototyping get, garners proof. It does two things. It helps you understand how to improve the product or service, whatever you're, you're prototyping. But it, it, it also generates little bits of proof along the way for reliability oriented people to say, okay, I can believe this because here's the data that's come back from the trial of the, la the latest prototype. Right. Whether that might be a product or a, a business model. Correct. Yep. Product, service, business model, customer experience, whatever. Yep. Okay. Um, well, it's always definitely good to, to try to get data back before you spend all the advertising and marketing dollars. That's right. That's right. Often, I mean, often people sort of will say, you know, it costs us half a billion dollars to launch a new product or 300 million, whatever the number is, as if it's all one big inseparable ball. But it often isn't. It's pieces of the puzzle. And you can use pieces that are that are less expensive to generate the proof that you need to say will invest the really big money. Right. Makes sense. Uh, second thing that we'll jump into here is you talk a lot about analytical mastery and intuitive originality and the need for a balance between the two. So how can companies infuse their organizations with the, the right amount of intuitive originality? Well, part of it is through assignments, and uh, uh, this is this is one of the things I encourage the companies that I end up working uh, with is to make sure on the career paths of people who they think of as high potential, who may have some real future to maybe be the CEO, to give them assignments that absolutely necessitate originality. So to give them an assignment of creating a new business unit, or creating a new and different function, or a new and different way of going to market. Because what I find is that for some companies, the way you get to the top is by running totally safe, standard businesses that are big and profitable so that you're running an ever bigger and more profitable business and keeping the, the trains running on time. And then you get to be CEO and things change in the market and you've got to try and invent the future and you, and you literally have had no experience at, at that. And so, so I, I really encourage uh, companies to add into their the repertoire people develop is uh, an assignment that would be originality oriented. The other way I, 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 t I tell people is that my own personal advice to them is every Friday night you come home from work, whenever it is, it's 5 o'clock or it's 9 o'clock or it's 11 o'clock, ask yourself the question, did I nurture my originality at all this week? By that, I mean, did I try to do something new in a different way than I hadn't tried uh, before? And, and if you can't say yes definitively, oh, yep, no, I remember on Thursday uh -huh. I tried that, then you're, you're developing an originality deficit. And you have to redouble your efforts to make sure you don't spend the next week on mastering e even more the things you know how to do already. So it's a little, just a little men mental arithmetic to keep. One piece of originality per week, it's like an apple a day keeps the doctor away. And, and maintaining yourself as the, the owner of that, that balance and ensuring that balance. Yeah, I think it's only an, a super inspired boss who will ensure that balance for you. 
So the very best bosses are the ones who say, say, you know, Braden, you know, you got to make those trains run on time for most of the week, but Braden, because it'll be good for you, I want you to try this completely new thing. We don't know anything about these new, whatever, I don't know, this new segment of customers, uh, you know, mil millennial customers. We just don't know how to deal with them. Go figure it out. See, that would be a good boss that says, I'm going to make sure you're deepening your mastery and nurturing your originality. I don't trust enough bosses to do that. So you have to, I think, take charge of that yourself to a greater extent uh, than, than you might think. Okay. And uh, number three, what are the keys to a design transformation in an organization? In the book, you write a lot about Procter & Gamble and the transition that they went through. Can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, I, th I think I think you have to work on several dimensions. Uh, one has to do with st structure, two is processes, and three is culture. So uh, st on structure, I think you have to do things like making your organizations more project-oriented. Uh, I think it, it crowds out design and innovation when you take things that are really a project and turn them into a permanent organization uh, because people then don't have a sense of we have to do this project that transforms something from X to Y. It's we just have to keep doing X, 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 X for a long, long time. So there are structural things you can work on. There are process things you can uh, work on. Lots of processes are oriented towards reliability. Uh, strategic planning processes are often. It's, you have to bring thick uh, PowerPoint decks that prove everything in, in, in advance. Well, you're not going to get much innovation there. If instead you make the, the strategy process about inventing the future and that that's acceptable to say, we can't prove this yet, but we think there's a possibility of inventing the future in, in this way. And then third is, is, is culture. And I think culture tends to flow from your structures and your processes. But there are cultural things you can, you can uh, uh, do. And for example, back to an earlier point, uh, if you ban the words prove it from meetings, from review meetings, just ban, ban it absolutely, that'll have the effect of, uh, of changing culture. But also if when somebody tries to invent the future and it doesn't work, if you don't punish them and say, well, that was the stupidest thing, it didn't work, instead say, you know what, we have to do five attempts to invent the future for every two or three that succeed and treat them that way, then you'll establish a culture of trying things rather than a culture of unless you're right all the time, you're in trouble. Right, and ultimately you should have an innovation portfolio approach so that if a couple things do fail, then the successes and the, the moderately successful will make everything overall pay off. You're absolutely right, and, uh, and, and the companies that are more sophisticated innovators will have that and will realize that some things are just going to just going to bomb. They don't know which in advance, uh -huh. right? Uh, uh, but they, they know it all won't work work out. So, so I couldn't agree more. Right. I mean, even Apple has the, the Apple TV. You know, they thought that was going to be a great thing. The okay. iPod has worked out great over time. Sure. The iPhone, but the, the but Apple yeah, TV. Look back. Look back. You know, Lisa, uh, Newton, uh, uh, the, the Cube. Uh, Apple TV, uh, they, they have a, they have, their history has been dotted with blowout failures, but their last time I checked the market caps, the, the fourth most valuable company now on the face of the planet, uh, they, they're always now in the top ten. Why? It's because I think in part it's because they failed so much. Uh -huh. uh, because what that means is they're trying to hit home runs and. Guess what? iPhone, uh, uh, iMac, uh, iP iPod, massive uh, uh, Macintosh, if you want to go back, massive uh, home runs. Yeah. And once again, this has been Braden Kelly of bloggingInnovation.com and Roger Martin of the Rotman School, the University of Toronto, and the author of the book, The Design of Business.